Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in improving so many different conditions, from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. So, oh, by the way, the title of our, the, the brand we have, Keto Naturopath, will probably be changing to Keto Carnivore Naturopath. Not that I am moving away or we are moving away from the ketogenic diet per se, or and that's any less desirable in our life than it ever has been. It's just that we focused, you know, our life has shifted to be very much protein oriented. And protein, I mean whole food. So without, every time I mention macros now, which I do think is a very partially useful way to refer to food, but obviously it's necessary if you're going to understand the key ingredients, the key components of the ketogenic diet. So you sort of have to be comfortable with this somewhat superficial way of referring to one's diet. It is incomplete, but it's like a lens that you have to think through at some level and then get a more refined understanding to what you're doing as you move on. So the ketogenic diet has to do with 20 grams of carbs or less. The classic ketogenic diet out in 1921 and completed in 24 was 25 grams per carbohydrates per day. So that otherwise is known as very low carbohydrate diet. So that aside, when I say food, assume there is no processed foods. Inane things that has come by is the marketing has really destroyed the medical and health integrity of the ketogenic diet, in my view. Why do I say that? Because there's things that are said that are not true. There's a whole shelf. There's a whole part of a, a grocery store now sort of devoted to quote-unquote keto products, and they are very refined and often heavily impregnated with poor quality foods, industrial oils being one. What are industrial oils? Industrial oils are vegetable oils. They're soy oils. They're canola oil. They are a rapeseed oil, which is the same thing by a different name. And so that's my issue. And then they start adding the preservatives, which by law they have to add because now it's a public product. It's not in somebody's kitchen where you can just have olive oil out of their container. So this whole barrage of all these products is grossly misserved, undermined the concept and the application of the ketogenic diet. So uh, that's always kind of an issue with me. However, people are making a lot of money doing that. So that's just the reality in the United States. You can say whatever you're going to say, and as long as it doesn't immediately kill anybody within the first hour, days, weeks, maybe even a month, then you're free to go. The FDA will give you open access to the population here. So it's about money first, health second, and health care third. Actually, probably health care second and health third. What I want to talk about today, and I said I would talk about this in a number of podcasts before, is, is really going on at, at length. If I had cancer, generally speaking, what would I do? So I'm not telling you to do this. I'm saying me, Dr. Carl Goldcamp, from what I have learned from the application of quote-unquote keto, the ketogenic diet. Why would I do that after talking at length with Dr. Tom Siegfried and all the other interviews I've done? I feel I have a better understanding of why I would do this, and I would take it very seriously. Having said that, there is not a lot of empirical documented studies that you can say ketogenic diet has cured cancer. You can't even go near that statement. However, so we come at it the back end, and the back end, meaning the possible application of this 
truthful adjunctive therapy called a ketogenic diet started long ago with Otto Warburg. Otto Warburg was the one who said, golly, something's going on here that I don't know about. By the way, interesting thing about Otto Warburg, Otto Warburg was in World War I, and so he's in Germany, right? World War I in Germany. Um, William Wilder, who is the creator of the ketogenic diet, was in World War I, and so was his uh, mentor, which I can't think right now, is at the University of Chicago. So they're all in World War I. Warburg is in actually the German cavalry, and apparently he was quite great. He was very good in terms of equestrian ability with his horse and all. And he was from a pretty affluent family. That doesn't mean anything other than this, that uh, in their, how people used to entertain themselves before is people used to go over people's homes and then they would have, uh, besides just sitting around coffee, cheese, or whatever to eat, they would have people perform. They'd have people on the piano. And so at the Warburg family, who would they have? They would have Einstein on the violin. Yeah, Albert Einstein on the violin. He was also from a fairly affluent family. This is all pre-World War II. This is pre-World War I. And so Einstein came out with his his laws, and his, his claim to fame was rising quickly in Germany. And Otto Warburg's mother sent a letter to Einstein and said, can you talk my son out of staying in the war. He somehow feels obligated he should be in the war. I think his fine scientific mind could be served in other aspects. And so Einstein, with the encouragement of Otto Warburg's mother, wrote him a letter who was, I think he was a lieutenant at that point, in the German cavalry and said, this is not for you. Uh, If you want to serve your country, there's other ways to do it. And what I know of you and your mind, and they knew of each other. They were good age difference, by the way. He said, I would really consider doing this. And I think the net would be that you would be serving Germany much better and certainly more suited to you personally to step away from the war and start your own lab. So he got a job at a lab and and on and on it went. That later, many a uh, generation or so later, became the same lab that uh, Hans Kreb, Krebs of the Krebs cycle took over. So interesting, just a little there. So anyway, they're all in World War One. And they all have this, this is back in the day in which people felt they needed to serve their country in that way. Can you imagine if there was, I hate to say a war, there's always a war now, in which doctors and med students said, you know, I feel the need to serve, not so much if I serve now, I'll get part of my student loan taken care of. You know, no, they actually had that incumbent upon them to fight for the fatherland or to serve the mother nation of the United States or UK, that doesn't exist anymore. They, they want disqualification. They want to get out of that, even a possibility. So things have changed considerably. So moving forward from there, they, these are thinkers of the same time. So post-World War I is when they exploded in their ideas. And so Otto Warburg was one who really started in marine biology or continued in marine biology, a special lab. And then he went into studying cancer and he found that this is all in talking to Tom Siegfried and also Tom Siegfried's book, Tome, I should say, called Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. It is basically saying that cancer has upregulated this ability to burn sugar phenomenally. It's an inefficient way to make energy, but they've upregulated it so it can do pretty well. And so it's a possible breakdown of the mitochondria, which takes in your ADP and goes through that, and it's a much more efficient way of making energy, but there's some sort of impairment in the system of the mitochondria, and who knows what that is. Warburg thought at the time that actually it was due to environmental toxins. He didn't come up with any particular toxin at the time, but that was his thought when people would say, well, what is the cause of cancer? As if there was one cause, And um, now we believe there are many causes in environment, and certainly is one of them. And in fact, when you go forward in time by, we're going 80 years now, the biggest reduction in cancer rates is due to removing toxic exposures to people. In other words, the, uh, the safety of food, the safety of environment, looking at water quality, looking at food quality. It actually, it shows a drop, but that's been the only thing that hasn't been due to one particular therapy. So it wasn't like there was a cancer therapy that came through. It was very successful and then the rates dropped. No, there's been some therapies in certain cancers and you can't have this global therapy for all cancers that have been effective to an extent. 
So like chemotherapy seems to be pretty effective for testicular cancer, but it's not for others and it's a particular kind. So anyway, so Warburg is the one that's saying, you know, there's an upregulation that even in the inability for the mitochondria to work well, cancer cells have the ability to use glucose. I said sugar, blood sugar, same, same. And that was kind of a breakthrough. So this idea, and he came up with that, I believe it was in the early 20s. He did not get the Nobel Prize for that. He got the Nobel Prize for identifying a cytochrome uh, P450 pathway in the liver and other parts of the body. Now we have this thing that Warburg is obviously very attached to and saying, you know, this is a definitive way of why cancer beats out everything else. It gets worse and worse and worse. And eventually people die from it because you can't stop it. It just grows, has, it has no growth limitation. He did come to this country and actually uh, worked for a while at, at Woods Hole. I think that was maybe a year, sort of a, an honorary exchange or something like that. That idea has, has not died out. Back to the Siegfried book and conversation and views and the prequels is that, as you know, when a cell becomes carcinogenic, it becomes weird, for lack of a better word, aberrant. It starts being able to do things that a normal cell won't do. And so what is seen is that the genetic component of the nucleus is thwarted. It starts to generate a number of genetic mutations, and these mutations go on to make for that aberration. So there's a lot of different genes there uh, that happen. And so this is called the genetic theory of cancer. That is, if you can find the right gene mutation, and if you can kill it, remove it, or make it inoperable, and that's what chemotherapy does, or any particular therapy is driven at, is focused on the particular mutations that have come about because of a cancer. If also, it's not just one thing. So you can't say testicular cancer is all about one particular gene mutation, even though certain chemotherapies are more successful with that. So breast cancer has a variety, pancreatic cancer has a variety, and it's really you're chasing one of many different poorly functioning genes or lethally functioning genes, and it's sort of a losing battle is the conclusion there. Whereas if you see cancer as a metabolic disease, that means you're focusing on the mitochondria, which is the production, the powerhouse for all of us and all of our cells outside of red blood cells to make energy. You have that working. And then when that stops working for whatever reason, it was impaired, then things get to be, that start, cell starts to shut down. It can't make the energy through the mitochondria. And so in the fluid that's around the mitochondria in the cell, so they call the cytosol, I, I call it the bathwater that surrounds the mitochondria outside of the cell. So the cytosol in the cells are outside of the mitochondria. There, you can do a thing called glycolysis, which is taking glucose and making ATP, and that's the alternative way of making energy, and it upregulates that. So the bathwater becomes very glucose-dependent, right? The cytosol becomes very glucose-dependent in terms of making its energy. So what do you do? The really interesting thing about cancer is that nearly all cancers, now I've hopefully given you the point that some cancers are, are different than the others, so, but collectively they thrive on this ability to use glucose as a fuel and they upregulate. So they're really very efficient. They become very, I will not say efficient. They're always inefficient, but they just make more and more glycolysis going on at the same time. And so therefore they can use more and more sugar, glucose at that time. So the idea is if a cancer becomes so dependent on glucose, if you can completely stop the glucose availability, you know, stop the delivery of the glucose, stop the availability of the glucose, a block, the uptake of the glucose, any of these methods should be effective at shutting down the cancer. And it appears that that's true. So it appears that that's true, meaning there are not a hundred studies and there certainly are not a study that says a hundred patients that did this, but you have things like Dr. Vulongo's fasting, imitating therapy. That is, they do fasting with chemotherapy. What does the fasting do? Fasting drops your glucose, makes it less available, and they find that it has a number of, of benefits, certainly in the very least, not having the side effects of chemotherapy that one would otherwise, like nausea, being sick and tired. So isn't that interesting? So from there, 
you now do have the application of the ketogenic diet as an adjunctive therapy in places in Hungary and Egypt and in Turkey. And some have been successful. And especially Hungary is really the heart of this application, among other things. They've always been an incredible melding of, if you want to call it alternative, but it's not a melding. You know, Hungary before World War I was the Venice of all of Europe. That was, it was the hydrotherapy hub of all of Europe, of Budapest in particular, and then other outlying areas for sure, both by the waters and their therapies and uh, the Czech Republic, now called Czechia, and it used to be called the Czech Republic. And before that was part of Czechoslovakia, which is Slovakia and, and the Czech Republic. Uh, so they had a place called Karlsbad, which was a German name. The German name has simply been reverted back to the Czech name, which is called Karl Yavari. I say that only because I've been there more than a couple times to study uh, the hydrotherapy and other applications, and it's just fascinating. So what I'm saying is that they had a predisposition. This was their medicine anyway. We in the United States call all of that alternative medicine, whereas in the 1800s and early 1900s, and even up until the 1990s, it was co-equal. And I believe it still is co-equal with quote unquote conventional medicine. So you sort of have to be leery of your perspective when you talk about what are we calling alternative medicine? So they were the hub. So their hub and their knowledge and their documentation of certainly a hundred years of documentation really go back to the usefulness of various different kinds of mineral waters, the different spring waters. They have it, you know, they know how to name and look at what is in that water and how to use that water for certain conditions. That's mind blowing. I've never heard that in the United States. That seems too low key, doesn't it? No, what you need is a really expensive cancer drug to treat that cancer, (laughs) ma'am, or sir. You can't just have mineral water, (laughs) you know. But anyway, it wasn't just mineral water. They have, it's a whole science called hydrotherapy, and part of it, which is the nomenclature of spring waters and their springs and healing centers that are throughout Central Europe, Hungary, and the Czech Republic primarily, that you go to that were for particular conditions. So some of you are thinking, oh, isn't that quaint? Didn't we like move away from that in this country? We're so sophisticated now. No, we forgot the application of that in this country. And now we are locked in a very expensive medical system and have no lesser ways or adjunctive ways to support our immune system, unfortunately. Okay, so their Warburg was basically from a culture that had a lot of this going on. And in his lab as he got into cancer being the primary focus before and after World War II. That's an interesting story how he's, uh, I think he was half Jewish. And so uh, he had a tough time in Germany until one of the higher ups pardoned him, forgave him for his Jewishness, that he was focused on how is this the case that glucose is so dependent and what can we do about this? So forward to the ketogenic diet. So the ketogenic diet is really pretty interesting because it does two things with one application. And the application is to provide a high amount of fat in the diet and or fasting, by the way. In other words, eliminate glucose as part of the food supply. So glucose comes into the food supply in a number of ways. It comes in fastest through carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are broke down, broken down into mono and disaccharides, saccharides being sugar. And so, for instance, when you talk about sucrose, which is table sugar, uh, that's 50-50 fructose and glucose. And both of those have the same molecular formula, but they have a different molecular structure. One's a hexagon and the other's a pentagon and a few other differences, but by the number of carbons and everything else, they're exactly the same. So they're tweaked a little bit different and they do have different effects. Okay, so it's about glucose. So if we can shut off the glucose by supplying fat primarily and by having hypocaloric, meaning we're doing a kind of fasting. This isn't like sit back and just eat fat for your life and and that's going to be therapy. No, it is you are fasting. So a full fast, just water fast, is you're not eating anything. You're starving and you starve for a limited period of time. And then you go into a hypocaloric and that means fewer calories than your body actually needs on a per day basis. And of that, zero or nearly zero calories of carbs. Well, your body can make its own glucose. So glucose is never out of the question. It's just that immediacy and the ease of which you can extract glucose from what you eat is far faster and more efficient. And when you remove that possibility, it becomes more difficult for the cancer cells to have access to glucose. Okay, then. 
but your body still goes into gluconeogenesis by the by both the fat, the glycerol, the fat, and the individual amino proteins, amino acids from the proteins that you're eating. It's a much slower process, and you can't spike your blood sugar. You might get into the 90s and maybe even the low 100s, but we're as as anybody knows who's been a diabetic or knows a diabetic, you know they can have blood glucose numbers up into the hundreds. So no, that's that's well beyond anything gluconeogenesis can do. And gluconeogenesis is a process that your body does. Your, your liver is involved in assimilating all these different things is the way I look at it. It takes, you know, strips off the fat, the glycerol backbones of your triglycerides, throws it together with some proteins and shazam, more or less shazam, that you have formulated a glucose molecule slowly. So, and part of your brain is required to run on glucose, but not much. So you can run probably, I think it's 90% on ketones, which is what happens when you just burn fat. So that's the objective of the ketogenic diet relative to cancer. So it, it starves the cancer from the its fuel that it absolutely needs, and then it gives via ketones a fuel that it cannot use. So you really are hoping for the net effect that you are smothering, you are removing the burnable fuel from the cancer, and it starts to shrink. And sure enough, it does happen that way. Let me step away and give you a larger concept is that, you know, some people go, well, I don't want cancer, but I don't have cancer right now. Should I do a ketogenic diet? Well, that's that's pretty hypothetical, right? Well, you want to be healthy because you don't want this outcome. I would say stop thinking about cancer. But the bigger point is, which is actually a pretty good idea, is to do things such as a fast every so often going through, whether you want to be in the ketogenic diet or not, to go through periods of fasting. And I would say, and it's arguable, the whole history of fasting, the research on fasting is really interesting. Get to that in a second as well. But if you can go with periods of time, and these are, it's kind of like training for a long run. If you think three-day fasting is easy, you're wrong until you've done it a couple times and you realize what it feels like and how your body fights you a little bit and then drops into, oh, we're fasting now, we can do this. So there's this little hump you get over. And when you get over that hump of you stopped eating and your body's going, so we're going to eat again. Lunch time? No, not lunch. Uh, Dinner time? No, not dinner. Breakfast time? No, not breakfast. Lunch? No. Dinner? No. Breakfast? No. And so it does a few of these days. And usually by your second day and into your third day, you're having an internal argument in which this drive, if you want to say your compulsion, this addiction, I don't want to use that word that too much in this case, is really saying, you know, you're starting to sweat, you're starting to feel jittery, especially if you had not fasted before, you're starting to feel pretty uncomfortable because now your stress hormones are coming into play. Your stress hormones are saying, please go eat something, we need sugar. So your cortisol is rising and your cortisol is actually starting to slam your liver is saying, make glucose, make gluconeogenesis, make glucose. And it does, but your liver sort of, it's like turning around a flywheel, very a rusty flywheel, very slowly. Okay, here's some glucose. Uh, yeah, a little better, a little better, a little better. And eventually by day three, for most of us, you're feeling pretty good. You learn to make your own glucose. The stress hormones go down. Um, usually, for me always, by the way, The first and second night are nearly sleepless. So as much as I might not be in that sweaty phase anymore, that it's no fun. I don't look for the two nights of not having good sleep. But then by the third night, you're back to sleeping well. And you pretty much can sleep well. The longest I fasted is uh, eight days. Maybe I've done nine. Eight days. I don't feel I need to go any longer than that. I really don't think anybody needs to go much longer than three days. But try your hand at it. And then putting it back into the concept of context of a adjunctive cancer therapy, learning to do that when you're not sick is a great way to be able to do that when you are sick, meaning cancer. You'll find that, uh, generally speaking, that animals, when they are sick, they stop eating. If you're wondering why they stop eating, and well, from the outside, you go, oh, they're sick, they're too tired to eat. Well, maybe it's not that they're too tired. Maybe it's they inherently, their metabolism inherently knows, let's not eat because it's going to help our immune system fight whatever it is we're fighting. So you've all heard of 
feed a cold, starve a fever. And this goes along with that sense. But that's in part of your appetite drops. You don't have any appetite. It's shifting into a ketosis. So you might go a couple of days without eating. There's a woman who I knew who had um, reports that she had uh, pretty advanced uh, ovarian cancer to the point that it looked like she had a small pregnancy and was feeling uh, lousy and she fasted for 11 days and it really shrunk her, her tumor and put it in remission. So uh, that's anecdotal, by the way. It's not scientific, but there's plenty of those. And you're, you know, where are you going to get this compilation of, of women who have ovarian cancer and they all fasted for 11 days and what their outcome, you're never going to see that. So it's always going to be anecdotal source of information on these kind of reports. And hopefully we'll get better. I don't know. I, I, I don't think conventional medicine is interested in, in, in any degree of effectiveness that fasting has. And as you know, there's fasting institutes still in Eastern Europe, i.e. Russia, and even the Czech Republic and such. So at least up until 10 years ago, they took it all quite seriously. And these institutes, for the most part, still there, still exist. So one of my big concern is that when people are, let's say you have early diagnosis of some sort of benign cancer, and you want to start taking care of yourself, and you heard all about keto, I would say I would think about practicing for a three-day fast. If you can make it to seven days, go. But don't starve yourself. The problem about recommending fasting is that it really plays people that have eating disorders. In other words, they may be able to fast, but they come back and they're going to eat all their calories back and, and actually accelerate whatever condition they had to a worse extent, exacerbate that condition. So take baby steps, fast a day, fast two days, fast then three days. So the history on fasting is pretty interesting. So George Cahill, he's a physician in the United States, works for the Jocelyn Institute, primarily in Boston. Then he retired and he uh, moved to Peterborough, New Hampshire. And so why do I know any of this? Well, he ended up lecturing at Dartmouth. I, and my high school years were in Hanover. And my dad was a doc at the Dartmouth Hospital, which is called uh, Mary Hitchcock Clinic. Then it's called the clinic. Now it's all over the place, primarily all over New Hampshire and, and uh, Vermont as an expanded hospital. But so he, in his retirement, would lecture at Dartmouth. And he would give these sort of post-grad lectures to non-science students. And he had so many people really interested in the workings of the human body and so on and so forth that he's just doing his free lectures in retirement because this is what he does and like to talk about and so on, that they would have to move his talks to a progressively bigger and bigger and bigger auditorium. You know, first it was like a small classroom. Some people showed up and these are people from town that are coming and post-grad students. And yeah, I got to hear this guy talk. And so you're getting more and more people to the point that the big graduation hall I forgot what that's called, but um, that's where we had our high school practice ceremonies for graduation, that he was filling up a complete auditoriums with his lectures. But what he did uh, back in the 60s, and uh, as you heard me reference before, in the 60s, it was such a time of rather liberal thinking for physicians and, and bravely naive, not dangerously naive, but bravely naive, great thinkers, curious thinkers would set up questions that they would then work to answer towards. So for instance, you had Dr. Kraft who was wondering, gosh, I wonder what people's insulin levels are with their fasting glucose. So he would do this glucose tolerance test, which is you take 75 grams of glucose and you would then measure glucose levels 30 minutes later, an hour later, two hours later, three hours later, and even up to four hours later. He said, why don't I take the fasting insulin with that initially you know, the 30 minutes, the hour, the two hours, and go on and start graphing that. So it was just his hunch. That's the one test he did. He just added one test and he did it for over 14,000 times, <laughs> over 14,000 people. So this obviously took a couple decades to do and he amassed a lot of data, but guess what? He's the guy, he is the guy who answered that one question that he thought of, you know, it's simple enough. He changed all of diabetes. He said that, you know, actually most of us are pre-diabetic, certainly back then. You know, processed foods are coming in like by the truckload and diets are changing for worse by the truckload. He was realizing that, that what he expected that, you know, you're going to be diabetic or not diabetic. It's like a switch. He goes, no, you're almost diabetic. You're pre-diabetic. And he would measure the 
height of the insulin level, how high the insulin was and how long it stayed up and how long it took for your glucose levels to come down to normal. And so that's brilliant. And that was one test. He simply took one test. He had a hunch and he, he simply included, I don't know if he paid out of his own pocket, but insulin's a pretty cheap test. And he had everybody do, he take the glucose and insulin at the fasting in 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. And then he had this graph and this chart, and now he's famous. And he, he died, uh, I think, within five years. That's amazing. So he's a guy who answered his own question and changed the world, in my view. There's another guy, Dr. Roger Unger, who is a physician in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas. And his whole focus was on, hmm, I think glucagon is actually the more important hormone in diabetes than is insulin. So he started doing his research around that and that's almost gotten to be forgotten and now it's coming back into vogue. So it was, he died a while back and, but his, his work started in the sixties and uh, that was his question. He's going to start, he was out measuring people's glucagons. You probably haven't even heard that. Nobody measures glucagon. Nobody measures insulin for the most part, except for a few docs. Now you can say, well, functional medicine docs should, I don't know if they do, they should. Now he is like, he has a lot of really interesting information about glucagon and, and so on. So that came out of the 60s. So why do I mention that relative to Dr. George Cahill? Well, Dr. George Cahill uh, went over the top in terms of, and you might say the 60s were not long after World War II. It's 15 years later, 15 to 20 years later, and we now know the stories of all the concentration camps and those who starved and, and those who died immediately upon release that ate themselves to death. You know, they had been fasting, starving for months. And suddenly when the allied forces came in and put all this food out there for them, they started, it was, it was too much food and you can't just, there's ways to come out of a fast. And nobody knew about that. That was totally unknown. Nobody said, you know, why don't we start off with some water first and then some juices and so on, which is what they do at the fasting clinic from Eastern Europe. And what? And there was plenty of fasting clinics, by the way, in the late 1800s in this country and in early 1900s, up until the time the ketogenic diet was formulated. And the ketogenic diet was formulated because of fasting was so in vogue and some people fasted too long and killed themselves or had their patients fast too long and killed them. And there were doctors that were brought up on murder charges because of, I wouldn't say overprescribing. How about undervigilant? They should have watched their patients more. So that's where the ketogenic diet came from because it was successful for epilepsy and it was successful for diabetes to a point. Interesting background, eh? Okay, so George Cahill, still not telling you the part of George Cahill's work, Dr. Cahill's work, is that he would get to medically observe in the hospital, people fast. And they fasted up to a couple months. So they were fasting as well as, I'd have to go check their references of the papers I have and what he's done, that they fasted and were given, you know, this is in the era of some supplementation. So they were given some supplementation. So they were pretty safe for a while. It wasn't just coffee. And they were watched, they were monitored. And if there was anything wrong, there was, there was, care there to help them. So here you have these patients that were entering into the program that fasted only a month. Can you imagine saying, I fasted only a month? Oh, a month. Think of that. 30 days of not eating. Two months, 60 days of not eating. Well, anyway, he took it upon himself saying, gee, I wonder what it would be like if I gave a group of these people that had fasted for a month, not all of them, just some of them, insulin. So what does insulin do? Insulin, there is a re insulin receptor to every cell, type of cell in your body outside of red blood cells, I think it is. So every cell in your body outside of, so brain cells, nerve cells, fat cells, of course, muscle cells, vascular tissue cells. And so he would give them insulin. So you go, wait a minute. Now you know this person, these people have fasted and they would track down their blood sugars. Their blood sugars are down to about 25. So what does that mean? Well, a healthy, normal blood sugar is between 75 and 85. For the American population in general, it's really right around 100, high 90s, 100. And that's getting only because we've accepted the whole obesity and, you know, we're all partially sick. And so we're down to 25, which is far below a healthy level. And they've, we're doing just fine. 
you know, their bodies were doing just fine and their blood pressure was fine, their heartbeat was fine, their sleep was fine. And so there was no need to intervene. So I thought, well, he thought, oh, I, why don't I give them some insulin? So insulin is about lowering your blood sugar and it does other things. So can you imagine that? You could not get this approved today. There's no IRB, it's the bureau that approves these things, no IRB board that's going to say, huh, give insulin to starving people who have already fasted for a month. Hey, that's an idea. And and what's the point? And to say the point is, I'm just curious. I want to see what would happen. And guess what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Guess what? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. He gave insulin to fasting people and nothing happened. Their blood sugar did not go down lower. So not quite sure what to do with that particular information, but it just shows that this kind of creative time, you actually were inspired. That's where MCT oils got discovered and used for making ketones to make the ketogenic diet uh, a little easier to do. So you didn't have to, especially for pediatrics. So that was an era under themselves. And so in that era, Otto Warburg is now an older man and he's still working away. And that was for a while thinking about, hey, the they now call it the Warburg effect. When you when a cancer is you can see that it's now using glucose passionately and and its mitochondrial are is starting to shut down, it's less effective. Let me summarize. The idea was that for cancer, if you could smother the cancer cells from glucose and simply offer ketones. And you would do that via having a high fat diet, lower, no carbohydrate and moderate protein. Moderate protein would be about a gram and a half of protein per kilogram, per kilo, kilogram of body weight. That's how they would measure it. So uh, I think you could probably go a lot higher, but the reason they don't go higher is is because the protein and some of the fat can be used to make glucose. So they try to keep it minimal. So the person's not going to die, but it's enough to keep it, hit that person's protein, i.e. muscle mass from getting smaller. So just enough to keep it going. So if you can smother cancer cells from glucose, maybe they will become smaller. Maybe they'll be reduced in size. Maybe they'll die. It's still a question mark, but there has been some successful anecdotal stories in this country, certainly, but some successful cases outside of this country. So it's still being worked on. The other aspect of this, uh, which I'll get into the next podcast, it's really about glutamine. So glutamine, once a cancer cell is sensing, maybe concurrent, it's like, what do you mean I'm not getting enough glucose? What do you mean my glucose sources are drying up or being smothered? given the wording I was using a little while ago, it then tends to start sucking off glutamine. Glutamine is an amino acid. It's a conditionally essential amino acid, meaning it's it's always in your body. I say conditionally essential. Well, they find that like in long distance runners and so on, that they will actually drive themselves into glutamine deficiency. So in that case, they'd have to have glutamine. Ordinarily, it's not considered an essential amino acid. It's kind of the ninth essential amino acid because it's conditionally essential. And if people have burns, uh, high burns, skin burns, that their glutamine is used for skin reparation. So their glutamine levels drop down to they have to be supported with glutamine. So there's that. Okay, until next time, I hope you got a good solid point about this application of why it would even be interesting to consider a ketogenic diet. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I just wanted to encourage you to send in your questions to drgoldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Many of you have, and so what I've done with these questions that I've gotten back to most of the people I email, but some of the questions that were so good, and if they were overlapping to other questions, I would combine them and try to put that into the topic of a podcast, either via one of the micro topics that are covered in an interview. As you know, we cover a lot of topics in a given interview or some of my own sort of reporting, if you will, on some of these issues. So please keep the questions coming. Feel free to send in an email and uh, I will get back to you. Stay listening, send in your questions, and I will definitely get back to you.